is my pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Teresa Barnes. Dr. Teresa Barnes received her PhD in African Economic History from the University of Zimbabwe in 1994. Born and raised in the US, Dr. Barnes spent the better part of 25 years after college living and working in Southern Africa. She lived in Zimbabwe and South Africa where she discovered the gravitational pull of African history. Her research focuses on political, gender, and institutional histories of South African universities, the political history of Zimbabwe, as well as gender, memoir, and autobiography. Currently, she's researching a South African philosophy, philosophy professor who was also a state censor, prosecution witness, and perhaps even a spy in the apartheid era of the 1950s and 60s, and is also researching solidarity between activists in the U.S., South Africa, and Zimbabwe. She holds a joint appointment at UIUC in History and Gender and Women's Studies, and we're so happy to have her here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Casey. Um, thanks for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the, the, the University Y, which has run a really stellar uh, Friday Forum series this year, and clearly it's going to carry on for another week or so. Uh, also for the last few years, um, I'm really honored to be uh, in the series this year. Um, there Art exhibits have also been quite remarkable in the in the big room over the course of the year, and also uh, I've learned that the Y has a very dedicated audience, which is um, many of you. Um, so it's a great community uh, altogether. So thank you very much. Um, you know, you all know about the technology gods, and hopefully the fickle finger of fate is pointing elsewhere today, but we may have some bobbles with the slides and the YouTube clips, so I hope at some point you will um, uh, be, have, maybe have to be patient. So um, I'm a historian of Southern Africa, and so today I'm going to talk about complicity and reconciliation through a Southern African lens. Uh, this month, April, happy April Fool's Day, um, this month marks exactly 20 years since the inception of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, which is probably the most famous example of institutionalized transitional justice in the world. Um, so I'd like to mark that anniversary by reviewing the TRC. Um, I, I know that many of you are very familiar with, um, with uh, the issues around the TRC, um, but it has been uh, 20 years, and it's, I, I hope, instructive to just uh, jog our memories about it and, and what it tried to do. Um, so I'd like to briefly review the TRC and talk about one case, out, one out of many possible examples, uh, along with some very, very recent developments and maybe some implications for that for us here in the, in the U.S. Um, first, I'd like to reflect for a second on my own experiences in these matters. Uh, as as um, Casey outlined, I've been very fortunate in the second half of my life to have lived in Zimbabwe and South Africa, to have met and worked and loved some truly remarkable people, uh, one of whom in particular many of you also know and love. Um, in that time, though, I feel that I have seen uh, the ebullient spirit of liberation in Zimbabwe rise and not just fall but crash. Uh, I've seen the euphoria of democracy in South Africa rise and crash. Uh, in a smaller way, um, many, almost all, of the hopes of the presidency of Barack Obama rise and crash. And most recently, uh, it feels like what the mainstream press regard as the opening up of Cuba uh, is going to become another long crashing of idealism and hope for a better world. So when I think on this list of living through uh, periods of hope and then long periods of disillusionment, one after another, uh, I remember a poem that I wrote in Zimbabwe in 1984. And here's where the technology gods have to help us out. So uh, this is a poem called Lesson. I wrote it when I was a history teacher, but I hadn't decided to become a historian yet. Um, history is not the tree of round apples to pluck and eat. The tree wood is fist bitter, like eating dirt for generations, and they do not learn what biled sap boils in our veins, what suck roots claw at the slag rivers, which rise in the hills of men broken in blood for the thousands burning, night after night, their dreams to ash to air. 
And I also think of my personal history, which is very interwoven with the dynamics of coping with the aftermaths of violence. I myself had a very placid childhood in some ways, but there were always, just out of the earshot of a little girl, stories of my father being grabbed off a bus in Columbus, Ohio, just because he was a tall black man. He was a graduate student in political science at the time. Um, stories of my grandmother insisting that she was a Native American princess because she didn't want to be black of my mother, who was raised in Virginia, shuddering in her adult life at the thought of ever living in the South again. In later years, there was also the situation of having to cope with the violence committed by my husband many decades ago, the aftermath of which has shaped my own family life in remarkable ways. In repudiating that violence and being marked but refusing to be completely defined by it, he led us through his own period of arrest and incarceration. My sons and I led ourselves through a period of truly remarkable solidarity with people in Southern Africa and in North America who staunchly stood by us through thick and thin and made it possible for me to continue to be a wife and a mother and an academic and keep my children sane. If I open up the lens a little bit wider than my own personal experience, I also see that the time that I've been on the planet, my country has officially and enthusiastically warred against all Native Americans and the people of, take a deep breath, Korea, Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, the Dominican Republic, Kuwait, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Syria, and violently schemed against the people of so many other nations. So although I have been free of the personal gender-based violence that has marred so many lives, in different ways I feel that I've been surrounded by the sounds, the smells, the smoke of violence all my life. I think all the time about how that smell lingers on for years, like the scent of rotting meat, long after the actual blood has been spilled and then presumably scrubbed away. So night after night, their dreams to ash to air. So in relation to the theme of my talk today, complicity and reconciliation, I guess you can see that these are words that mean a great deal to me, both personally and professionally. So my understanding of the word complicity comes from a book written by Mark Saunders, there he is, sorry, he's a little blurry, called Complicities, the Intellectual and Apartheid. In it, he analyzes the way that some South African intellectuals and artists, poets particularly, turned their personal and national histories of struggles for freedom into reasons for putting their boots on the necks of other people. In particular, he defined complicity as a word that he coined called foldedness. Foldedness, which is kind of a clumsy term, but uh, it means that all of our lives are folded in with the lives of others. Um, and that it means that one action is always folded into or connected to other actions. And so this means that, this, that static definitions of word like perpetrator and victim don't make sense. The hand that holds the knife is supported by many arms, and the blood that is spilled pumps out from many veins. If complicity means foldedness, then our understandings of guilt and innocence must correspondingly be widened to include a collective element. It also means that people are directly implicated in acts of violence, but in a kind of a non-judicial way. Um, the standard of guilty beyond a reasonable doubt has to give way to a rippled sense of shared responsibility. And reconciliation, therefore, also has to signify something like a connection that, ables, that enables new growth. So let's keep those ideas of ripples and connections um, and folding, foldedness in mind. And let's go to South Africa um, to talk about complicity and reconciliation there. And to do that, of course, Jakey. And to do that, of course, um, we have to look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Again, I know that many of you are very familiar with, uh, with the TRC. Um, but I, I, I hope you'll uh, indulge me as we just run through an outline of what it was and what it tried to achieve. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Nelson Mandela was released from prison in 1990, uh, and there was then a period of about three years where there were multi-party negotiations about the, the smaller dots that you see there, uh, what a new government would look like, um, what minority rights needed to be entrenched in a new 
uh, dispensation, uh, writing a new constitution, and uh, a way to address politically motivated crimes of the past. Um, this, uh, the, the new government that came about was a um, product of, obviously, of negotiation and concessions. Um, so elections were held in 1994, which the ANC won, and as we all know, Nelson Mandela became the first president of the Democratic South Africa. And out of that period of uh, negotiation comes the, the TRC, um, which was meant to be an institutionalized way to answer some of these really difficult and complicated questions about the legacies of violence, about uh, how victims should be treated, how they should be um, acknowledged and treated, what's compensation, what is reconciliation, whose memories about apartheid matter, uh, and how is all of this connected together. So those are big questions that the TRC was put in place to try to answer. Um, and it, it tried to answer those questions by uh, undertaking three main activities. Um, the first was documentation of what had happened um, during part, as we'll see, part of the apartheid period. The second, which is what most people focus on when people talk about the TRC, and that's the mechanism to grant amnesty to people who, were, who had been um, involved in political crimes. And the third part was to uh, consider how victims should be compensated for um, the human rights abuses that they had suffered, so the payment of reparations. Um, the TRC, as you know, was a limited, um, it, it, it limited its scope in answering those big questions and in undertaking these three sets of activities. Um, it was, uh, those of you who pay attention to budgets and things, you'll appreciate, um, you know, it was an institution, so it had three years, it had employees, it had a budget, uh, it had offices around the country. So it, it was, for a while in South Africa, an actual physical thing, a place that people uh, could go to. Um, as I've said, it, and as you know, it was limited. Uh, there were lots of things that the TRC did not uh, investigate or try to document. Um, and. Um, a lot of these things that it did not take up were the things that um, related to people's daily lives, uh, or the, not only their daily lives, their monthly lives, the, the, their lifespans um, in, in South Africa. So um, displacement based on race, things that were done to people before 1960 because they looked at only at the period of 1960 to 1994. Um, everyday pra policies and practices that didn't result in people dying. So if, if there was no killing, you know, no torture, even if there was brutality, um, the TRC didn't take that up. Um, and uh, all the other institutions of daily, weekly, monthly life social services, education, business, healthcare, and so forth. Um, the TRC didn't look into things like that. So um, all the ways that people were profoundly discriminated against in education, uh, in the jobs they could, they could attain, all of that, none of, none of those sorts of things were taken up by the, by the TRC. Um, here's some pictures of uh, you know, some of the iconic um, images that came out of this. Um, three-year period of, of uh, looking into those, those three activities. Um, of course, the TRC, the, the, the lead commissioner, the head commissioner, was a really, truly remarkable human being, uh, Desmond Tutu. He wrote a book called No Future Without Forgiveness. The picture next to that is him with his head on, on his desk, sobbing at uh, a, particular, a particular piece of testimony that he had that he had heard. Um, the picture at the bottom is kind of the way a TRC hearing looked. Um, you see a semicircle there of the commissioners who were eminent South Africans who were appointed to, to run the commission. Uh, someone giving testimony there standing up in the middle. And then it was a public, some of these were public uh, hearings. And so there was the public at the end. And the idea was to um, involve a lot of really complicated uh, dynamics uh, forgiveness, healing, um, and and all of that was meant to prevent people from retaliating uh, against the people that they had defined as 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 people who had oppressed them. Um, forgiveness and acknowledgement uh, of of perpetrators that they had committed a crime. So all of these all of these di complicated dynamics 
um, and a budget of $40 million and four offices around the country and a set of about 15 commissioners and um, thousands of people, as we'll see, giving testimony. Um, uh, it was a very public affair. Uh, there's still on the internet lots of, you know, the, the, the TV, um, uh, a record of the, of the, uh, of, of different hearings. Um, over that three year period, thousands of people, 21,000 people uh, came and uh, testi testified in front of the, well, there are 21,000 testimonies um, a, a, to the commission. Um, often tears, very dramatic uh, uh, sometimes uh, hearings. Um, so it started in 1996, so 96, 97, 98, it was officially over uh, in 1998 and the first three volumes were published uh, and the, of, of its report. Um, a, few more, a few more volumes came um, and the last one was published in 2003. Um, in terms of that first activity, the following things were documented uh, on the basis of the investigations and the hearings that had happened. Killings, disappearances, tortures, raids uh, across South Africa's borders into neighboring countries, um, killings. Um, importantly, uh, th these um, activities were activities that were not just committed by the apartheid state. Some of them were also um, killings, disappearances, torture that had been committed um, by um, members of the uh, liberation uh, armies as well. So it was meant to be a more even-handed um, uh, affair than, than only focusing on, on quote, one side. Um, abuses in detention camps, that's uh, part, part of why that makes sense, um, and violence that was committed by private individuals for political reasons. So, all, so in, the, in the volumes of the final report, you see documentation of, of a lot of, of, of these kinds of actions, who did them and where they happened and why. So that was the first activity. The second was the amnesty program, which uh, carried on a little bit after the formal end of the commission. It only ended in uh, 2001. Uh, and this is what people usually focus on when they talk about the TRC, um, that a person who, who, who came to the TRC said, this is what I did, this is how I did it, this is why I did it. They would apply for amnesty, which meant that they couldn't be then um, prosecuted in any other way for having committed that act. But you'll see here that um, out of the 7,000 applications for amnesty, most of them were unsuccessful. Um, only about 2,000 people were granted amnesty for the, uh, for the applications for the violent acts that they had committed. Um, and uh, the commissioners used a set of tests about whether a person should uh, receive amnesty or not. Um, whether the act was proportional to the uh, objective that they had, um, if they had fully disclosed all of the details about how this particular act had come about, how it was planned, how they did it, um, who, who else was involved, if it involved any kind of payment or money or all of the details about that particular violent action, which you can imagine is very difficult to decide what full disclosure actually consists of. Um, and lastly, um, you could only get amnesty if, uh, under the TRC if you had committed and had, it was proportional and you fully disclosed if it was an act of political violence. Um, and they drew a very clear distinction between uh, political violence and criminal violence. Criminal violence would be something that was committed for personal gain or because you, you just hated somebody. So if you went out and killed your neighbor because he'd always let his dog poop on your lawn, um, that was not an act of political violence. That was an act of personal violence and it was not eligible uh, for amnesty. Um, okay. Um, uh, so, in, as I've been talking, I'm sure you've been reading those last uh, uh, bullet points there. Um, it, the hope was that more people would come forward. 7,000 people is not very many, and in particular, the senior members of the apartheid government did not come forward. The minister of police, the minister of justice, the, the, the leaders of death squads, the, the policemen in every uh, police station around the country, um, the, the deputy interim assistant ministers who had signed, uh, you know, uh, programs uh, of, 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 of torture and, 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 and uh, uh, research on how to kill people. None of those people came forward to ask for amnesty. 
Um, but the hearings that per, that occurred from the that we saw in the previous slide, they did provide some new details um, about all the things that you see there. Okay, so that was the second uh, activity. This is the third activity, reparations, um, and that program also went on a little while longer than the formal end of the commission. Um, Basically, the reparations program uh, involved a very small number of people and very small amounts of money. Um, there were emergency reparations paid here in 1998. The larger, to, uh, to a very small number of people, 2,000 people, um, and in 20, 2003, after a lot of, of, of pressure from what South Africans call civil society, um, about 22,000 people uh, were given the equivalent of about $4,000. It was a once-off payment. That's what people got. Um, and I was thinking it's hard to work out what $4,000 means, but um, if you were a domestic worker in South Africa, that's about three years of salary. Um, and this uh, 25,000 over 40 million is uh, 25,000 people altogether receiving reparations over 40 million, which is the, the population of uh, South Africa is about 50 million, about 80 million of, uh, sorry, about 80 percent of those are people of color, so that means 40 million people. So 25,000 people out of 40 million people is like a tiny little percentage of people who receive some kind of monetary. Uh, reparation for their suffering during the apartheid period. Um, those of you who are interested in this, I would I would send you to the um, website of the Kulumani Support Group, kulumani.net. Um, here, uh, they have been one of these uh, civil society groups that's been pushing over the years for reparations to be. Um, uh, paid attention to and also to be paid. Um, and there's information about how little that $4,000 was and um, it, it didn't, it, it generally went to people who needed it to pay their debts, to pay school fees. It, it really wasn't enough for people to make a new start uh, in, in, in any way. Okay, so that's, that's just the TRC and now I'd like to tell you about a particular um, case that involves our, um, our themes of complicity and, and reconciliation um, and the TRC as well. Okay, so if you were here earlier while we were working on our, on, uh, on uh, pushing the fickle finger of fate off somewhere else, you saw some of these slides. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a gentleman named Tembisile Chris Hani, uh, who was born in 1942 uh, and died in uh, 1993. Uh, he, when he died, he was 51 years old. He was married with three young daughters, and he was assassinated in the driveway of his home uh, in a town called Boxburg, which is kind of like an outer, outer suburb of Johannesburg, in April, again, uh, 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 23 years ago uh, from this month. Um, at the time of his death, he was roughly the second most popular leader of the uh, African National Congress, Nelson Mandela, of course, um, being uh, who at that point in 1993 had been out of prison for three years, was of course the ANC leader. Um, whereas Mandela had been in prison for 27 years, Chris Hani uh, had spent the same, that same period uh, in exile, uh, working his way up from being a, a university graduate and communist turned guerrilla fighter to becoming the head of the armed wing of the ANC and secretary general of the South African Communist Party. Uh, he lived in Botswana, in Zambia, in Mozambique, in Lesotho, in Tanzania. Uh, he had a very up and down career with the ANC in a way. Um, he had written a denunciation of the ANC leadership for not being radical enough. Um, he thought at the time he'd been expelled from the movement, he'd been reinstated, and he'd become revered by a younger generation of ANC members who saw him as somebody who would say words like you see there um, on the right uh, in, the, in that red. I fear that the liberators will emerge as elitists who will drive around in big cars and live in palaces and gather riches. So he was someone who appealed to the uh, uh, to a younger generation of the membership, and he was known as a person who was not afraid to say what he thought and to tell the truth. Uh, overall, uh, he was charismatic, he was an insightful, he loved reading, he loved the Latin language, uh, and he loved his wife and three daughters. And now this is where I have to see if I can manage to show you a clip of 
Anwen, Anwen has come to save the day, and now she's coming to save the day again. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is about five minutes long. It says it's longer than that, but I will stop. Thank you. Just get behind the line. Sorry, can you go behind the line? Just stay behind the banner, please. So let's go right here, sir. We are going to let you all through it. No more people coming. Hold on, we are now going to announce the Not, not, wait, shh. Hold on, not, Ronnie, 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 not everybody, well, Brian, I tell you went back from the mine. I tell you square. <laughs> When we established ourselves in the Soto and were able to set up the underground and military units inside the country and began to operate, South Africa became nervous. They decided to eliminate me in 1981 by sending an agent to plant a bomb under my car. That uh, attempt was abortive. Then they made uh, two other attempts to get me killed. In 81, they Rather than 82 or 81, I'm not sure. They sent units of the SATF to go and kill as many of our people inside the suit, including refugees. Because their intelligence was faulty, they thought that I was in the country. They tried to attack the flat where I used to stay. But uh, just a, f a flat away from my own, they attacked, convinced that uh, I was in that flat and killed the locals. So this was a measure of desperation. It was not only in Lesotho, they went across Mozambique and killed refugees and a few of our comrades, they went into Botswana. They were crazy. They, 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 they decided that uh, they were going to take off their gloves and that they were going to kill anybody who harbored us, who, 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 who was unfortunate to stay next to us, whether it was, he was a Musotu, a Mutswana, a Zimbabwean. That was the nature of the frenzy existing in Pretoria. It makes me actually uh, realize, you see, with impatience, the need to, to, to defeat you know, this, this, this regime. And uh, I don't mince my words when I'm speaking about this regime. I hate it intensely. I hate it. Every time I stand on a platform, I'm reminded of these gruesome atrocities. I'm even reminded of my own children. If they had succeeded, they were killed. My children were, you know, at that time, one of them was two years old, another one 10 years, a baby. And I saw it as a basically an inhuman regime, a cruel regime. And people who were fighting for a right to oppress the majority of the people of this country. And I, I, I disagree with a lot of people who think that Titi Clegg and others have changed. 
Because Dick Clark and others have done nothing about uh, you know, removing the forces that they created. You know, it's not just Hammer van der Vestes and Gerd uh, Hugo or whatever, whatever his name. It is those people who strategize and, pro and worked out the strategies and tactics of destroying us. Dick Clark, Rolf Meyer, Adrian Flock, Magnus Malan, Big Potter, who are, were in the center of the strategy of uh, killing people you know, in the State Security Council. And therefore, we, that's why some of us have got reservation about the amnesty they are talking about. Before you consider an amnesty, let us see what they did. They, when we were coming back, they wanted us, they, they, they forced us to fill forms to say, what did we do? And I think that should apply to them as well. Okay. Uh, okay, and back to the yellow one. Hey, Anwin. Yellow one? Uh, yellow one. Okay. And... Yes? Yes? Oh, I think, maybe, yes. Okay. All right. Um, these are pictures of Janusz Walusz and Clive Darby Lewis. Um, Clive Darby Lewis was an English-speaking white South African, and for some reason, the English pronounced Derby like Darby, so his name is always Clive Darby Lewis. Um, Walusz is the man who gunned Hani down in his driveway. You saw his, his body there in, in his driveway in the clip. Walusz was born in Poland, and he emigrated to South Africa and was a devout anti-communist. Darby Lewis, on the other hand, was a member of the Conservative Party in South Africa. That was a political party. Uh, also an anti-communist and an outspoken racist. He had been the mayor of a small town, a national office holder, and a member of parliament for the Conservative Party, which moved to, to the extreme right um, as the ruling national party had shifted to ne the negotiations phase with the ANC in the 80s. Darby Lewis was once described as the most racist member of the South African parliament, so you can imagine how how bad that was, and he said things like this. Um, uh, if AIDS stops black population growth, it would be like Father Christmas. It would be, you know, it would be a gift if the black population stopped growing. Um, he had international links with people like uh, David Irving in Britain and uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen in France. Uh, in 1993, Darby Lewis was training a private white militia, and he gave Walush the gun that killed Honey. The two were apprehended very quickly on that day in April 1993. Um, there's a story about how they were caught, which is uh, very similar to the way that um, Dylan Roof was caught here in the United States by somebody who trailed them and thought this doesn't look right and, and, and called the police. There's some uh, interesting parallels there. So they were caught very quickly, um, and in six months they were tried, they confessed to, and they were sentenced to death for Hani's murder. Uh, they said that they had decided to kill a whole long list of black leaders, of whom Hani was the first, in order to trigger a race war, which they believed uh, the whites would win. Um, ironically, when the, uh, the death sentence was declared unconstitutional in the new South Africa uh, that came about despite their efforts, uh, and their sentences were then commuted to life imprisonment. From prison, both of them applied to the TRC for amnesty, but they were denied because the commissioners thought that they hadn't fulfilled all those conditions that, that we saw on the earlier slide uh, for amnesty. Specifically, the commissioners said that killing honey could not be considered a formal political crime because as far as they could tell, it had not been ordered by a political organization, and that the two men had not told the entire truth about their actions. So that was the, the, the reasons that the, their amnesty applications were denied. Okay, so now we have to skip forward about 23 years to the current day from Hani's murder, and what has happened to Darby Lewis and to Walush. Um, if you've been reading the South African press, you will have seen, in fact, that Darby Lewis was released from prison in May 2015. He was given a medical parole because he had stage four lung cancer and the court was told that he only had six months to live. That was in May of last year, almost a year ago, he's, and he's still alive. In the last two weeks, uh, again, if you've been reading South African newspapers, a high court judge named, 
Nicolene Janssen van Nieuwenhuizen, there she is, um, has overturned the South African Minister of Justice's repeated decision not to grant parole to Janusz Walusz, which is one of those sentences with lots of negatives in it. But what that means is that the judge has said that the minister cannot keep Walusz, the minister cannot deny his parole application. Therefore, the judge has ordered him to be freed within 14 days, and that 14-day period will actually come to pass uh, next week, so you may want to be uh, watching to see what happens next week. Um, judge von Neuenhuizen noted that Walush had apologized to the Hani family, even though the Hani family has refused to accept that apology. Um, the reports are that the judge was convinced that Walush's apology was heartfelt and sincere, and that therefore the minister should not keep a man who had served 23 years in prison, in, in prison indefinitely because his victims uh, refused to accept the apologies. But we have to return to our, 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 our concepts of complicity and to ripples. Um, another, uh, the director of the Kulumani support group, who you've, who you, who you've seen, um, uh, asks, has noted that the following questions about Hani's murder have never been answered. And she writes, it's known that Mr. Wallish received the weapon he used from Mr. Darby Lewis, and he independently bought ammunition. He conducted surveillance of the Hani home. He prepared for this killing in the way that assassins prepare for a mission. But assassinations are not conducted without being masterminded by a higher authority. So who was this higher authority? Why has this never been disclosed? Who directed Mr. Wallish to target Mr. Hani, and why? Whose orders was Mr. Walush carrying out? Who else was involved in the planning and execution of this mission? Was he aligned with any of the secret apartheid units at the time that carried out other targeted killings? How did Walush connect with those people if he did? On what basis did he agree to conduct the killing of Mr. Hani? Was he going to be paid for it? What had he been told by Mr. Hani and by whom? For what purpose? There all, these, all these questions. What was his occupation at the time? For whom did he work? Um, if he wanted to trigger mass violence in South Africa on the eve of the transition, had other steps been organized to, uh, to, to other steps been taken to organize uh, that, um, that, 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 that warfare? Uh, and if so, what were they? Um, so there are many, many, many questions uh, about, about this. So this long list of questions makes us realize the foldedness of Walush's act. He wasn't alone, although he was the only person in the car that pulled up into the Hani driveway that morning. His accomplices were probably characters from his past in Poland, and South African people, maybe members of the Conservative Party and beyond, who hated the idea of a non-racial democracy in South Africa. But now, there is no process to identify those people or to require them to speak. There is only the outrage of Mrs. Limpo Hani, Chris Hani's widow, who refuses to forgive. There, you see her there. She refuses to forgive. She refuses to reconcile. And she said that the truth about her husband's murder has never been told. She has called Judge Van Nieuwenhuizen a racist. And she says that the murder of her husband was like her own private holocaust. So this is a case where the foldedness of complicity is obvious to everyone but it has not been stated or acknowledged or revealed, and where consequently there's no reconciliation. Uh, I think you can see here that the TRC as an institution did not come to grips with these complicated and long-term dynamics. So um, the idea of, to sum up, the idea of foldedness and, uh, asks us all to consider how and where we are each accomplices in other people's actions, and to think about the dynamics of shared collective responsibility rather than simply individualized culpability for violence. Um, and in a country like ours, uh, this one, which uh, ironically simultaneously maintains a huge presence of violence on the one hand and an enormous narrative about national goodness on the other, um, it's perhaps a subversive thought to think about the foldedness uh, of, of, of complicity and reconciliation. Um, and in relation to the story that I've just, that I've just told you, um, we have to ask ourselves here, living as we do uh, in the belly of the beast of mass incarceration, uh, is it right, is it right that Clive Darby Lewis, 80 years old, and Janusz Walusz have once again uh, become free men?
um, um, I think that perhaps Mrs. Honey would also say with me, night after night, their dreams to ash to air. Thank you. Now I can see you. Thank you. Um, I know um, Casey has a microphone if there are any comments or questions. Jump up. Um, how much of uh, the amnesty request came from the opposition? And can you break down any of that? Uh, how much of the amnesty request came from the opposition? Uh, yeah. I think the vast majority of it. And they were mostly turned down too. Uh, another question, reparations. It's so insignificant. Uh, but I'm wondering whether there was any uh, cross-fertilization. There has been a lot of that historically from the U.S. and South Africa in the discourse about reparations. If there's been any, any cross-fertilization between the U.S. and South Africa in the discourse about reparations, um, not that I know of. No, I, not that I know of. Uh, you can see that that was a fairly uh, circumscribed period of time from 1998 to about 2003, so just that five-year period. Um, and there has been nothing since then. So the, the, the whole discourse in the United States that comes and goes about reparations for, for uh, uh, land dispossession and, and, and slavery, I, I don't think has meshed up with the South African discourse. I have a question over here. Um, I think you oh, partly I... answered the, the question already, but um, I visited Robben Island last summer along with a very large number of tourists. And I, I was going to ask about reparations too. Are, are any of those being paid now? And if so, does any of that come from the proceeds of Robben Island? Oh, uh, no. no. No, the reparations uh, uh, program ended in 2003. There, nothing else has been paid since then. Uh, Robben Island has been kind of incorporated as a as a museum. Uh, as I, I'm sure it's uh, part of the Ministry of Arts and Culture and Tourism. Um, as you will have seen, I think some of the people who are employed on the island are former political prisoners. Um, and in that sense, they are given employment there. Um, but where the, I think, I would assume that the proceeds of the, tour, of the boat, boatloads of tourists who come to Robben Island to see the place, and it is, a, am sure you'll agree, a very interesting and moving experience. Um, I would, I, that money it goes to uh, upkeep of the, of the, of the, the museum, I mean the whole island is now considered a museum um, as part of the, I would, I would think, the Ministry of Arts and Culture. Maybe I can. We, we, have, a, we have another question. Trouble making the obvious. Uh-oh. Is that on? That's right. Um, I, I just want to add one thing about this dialogue between the U.S. and South Africa. In, in the past. It's not, it's not doing anything what you're doing, so just speak up. In the, past, in the past three or four years, a few people that have been campaigning against mass incarceration in the U.S., particularly Mutulu Shakur, who's a political prisoner in the federal system, and more recently, people from All of Us or None in, in, in San Francisco have been talking about a process of truth and reconciliation to deal with mass incarceration and reparations for communities that have been directly impacted. That, that's a little bit different piece from the, from the major dialogue around reparations did everybody hear that? Okay. Um, well, I can add it. Oh, yes, there's a question. You know, as time goes on, I've changed my views on that. I, I, I when the when the TRC ended, I I was very um, 
very, very critical. I've, I've become a little less so over time because I, I think that the documentation, even though limited, that occurred is actually very valuable, um, not just for historians and graduate students and you know people who want to write books about South Africa, but um, I think to some extent, at least there is there is an archive of something, and before there was nothing. So there is there is that. Um, I I think. Um, that uh, it could have, I, I don't know if it could have, because it was born from those political compromises in the 1990s where all kinds of things were happening. Bombs were going off and people were being slaughtered and nobody knew what was happening and it, it was a very confusing moment. So um, at least something came out of that period in, in this regard. I, I think um, that a, 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 an institution like this needs to be thought of maybe in terms of a sequence. So this. That was that was a good first step. If it had been if it had been followed by some other second step of some kind, on a on a local level, on a provincial level, where people were trained to talk about how do you induce dialogue, um, how how can we urge people to come forward? If there had been some kind of a second step and maybe a third step, even if it had just been sketched out at that time, I think that that would have. I think that that would have um, been an improvement than this, this this idea of something that's just going to happen once, like the reparations payments. It's just going to happen once, and that's the end of it. TRC, you know, it's three years or it's five years, and, the, and nothing else will ever grow from that in an institutionalized way. I think thinking about thinking about it over a longer time span would have been really, really helpful. Yes, hi. Yeah, it was. Um, uh, if you go again to the website of the of, of the Kulamani support group, you can uh, read one of that. One of their major um, critiques is that people were not involved in those decisions, and in order, even in order to get that paltry four thousand dollars, which today is like three thousand dollars, based on the depreciation of the of the currency in South Africa. It was arbitrary, and even that they had to push for. I mean, the TRC ended, and then they had people pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, and three years later they got this this small sum of money. So they weren't involved in that, uh, as far as I know, uh, at, at all. Um, and your your second question um, was about. Sorry, I got. I, uh, uh, oh. Oh, were they present at the telling? You know, that kind of depended on individual circumstances. Um, uh, some in the high-profile ones, the Hani family, or Chris, or um, Steve Biko's family, or the the family of the Google H7 would be taken to the hearing because it was a big public event. Um, in other cases, in smaller, not smaller cases, but less well-known cases, um, if you could make it. To there, you, it was pretty much under your own steam. Um, I was I was reading uh, yesterday the test. It wasn't only uh, other people testified as as well. I was reading the testimony of a young man um, named Yazir Henry, who had been an ANC guerrilla, who had been captured, and he had been um, he. He, he was told that he had to hide, he had to basically betray some of his comrades or the apartheid police would kill his mother and his four year old nephew so he betrayed his comrade and he came to the TRC to tell his story of betrayal um, and this you can imagine uh, what a harrowing um, uh, experience this was for him uh, he 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 came out in public in like one of those 
one of those hearings and said, this is what I did. I can't sleep at night. I have these nightmares. This is why I did it. Um, and he said, you know, he said there were some good things and some terrible things that came out of the decision that he made to, to expose himself in that particular way. Um, he wasn't asking for amnesty, but he wanted to, he wanted to tell, he wanted to tell his story. Um, now, whether or not the family of the comrade that he had betrayed w w was in the audience that day, maybe they were and maybe, you know, maybe they weren't. So a lot of times it would depend on individual circumstances. Thanks for the question. At the, at the time of the, okay, so emotions, uh, tough, tough, tough question there, Chris. At the time of the TRC, they, they tried to institutionalize services to help people come as they broke down, basically, as people started weeping and wailing in front of uh, the, uh, and, and generally it was women, um, and, and many people have noted this, that if there was any reconciliation in South Africa, it was often on the backs of and in the tears of the mothers and the sisters and the daughters and the aunts of, of people who had been killed. Um, so there were some services there, people to gather them together and hold them and, 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 and to support them uh, during, the, during that process. Again, that was very, that was very limited. I think your, your question, though, goes to a much bigger arena of dealing pos in positive ways with people's emotions and uh, the grief that they feel, the anger that they feel. Um, uh, Mrs. Honey, I, I mean, it's not, it's not for me to, to say, you know, what might it take for her to say, it's okay for these people to be let out of prison when we know that all of those questions, and I actually had a really long list of questions, there were like more that I didn't, that I didn't read because you know, it was kind of obvious where we were going. So none of those questions have been answered. If all of those questions were answered, maybe she would think differently about how she's handling her grief and her anger and her disappointment and her disillusionment. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure how you institutional how you make a a, a place where uh, and a space for people to talk about grief and truth and anger and death. Um, it, it's going to be different in in different places, I think. But what I think what this does show us is that a limited, even a, to some extent, a limited. Um, uh, 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 effort in that direction can be useful, even if it's limited, um, but that there always needs to be more. That's not a very good answer. But, uh, <laughs> was, there a, was, there another, was there another hand up over there? No? Well, it's, it's right at one o'clock, so thank you all very, very much for coming. I do appreciate it. Thank you.